Want to start saving money and energy at home? Eversource, proud sponsor of Energize Connecticut, is here to help with our in-home energy service. For just $50, our certified technicians will give you a unique home energy score and conduct on-the-spot services. Plus, you'll get rebates and incentives on efficiency upgrades, like improved insulation to stay comfortable and save money all year round. So don't wait. Go to Eversource.com to get started today. Paid for by a charge on customer energy bills. This is MuggleCast, episode 5, for September 3rd, 2005. If you haven't finished reading book 6 yet, then you probably shouldn't listen to this, as we do talk about several different plot spoilers. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's edition of MuggleCast. I'm your host, Ben Shane. I'm Andrew Sims. I'm Kevin Steck. I'm Jamie Lawrence. And I'm Eric Skull. Let's go to Micah for the past week's news. Thanks, Ben. We begin with director Mike Newell, who recently spoke about his favorite time while filming Harry Potter and the Goblin of Fire. He said aside from everything else, these are school stories. In a middle-of-the-road English education, the teachers are embattled, the school is a very kind of anarchic place, and a very funny place as well. Despite Newell's apparent love for the school nature of the films, MuggleNet reader Hope, who had the chance to catch a sneak peek of the new film, said that we only get to see one classroom scene in Goblet of Fire. To find out which one, stay tuned as this is the crew's main topic of discussion. Those of you looking to expand your Harry Potter Lego collection, fear not. On Thursday, LEGO.com's online store released four new Lego sets, Rescue from the Bird People, Graveyard Duel, Harry and the Hungarian Horntail, and the Durmstrang Ship. Moving from movies to video games, the Goblet of Fire video game trailer was released Friday featuring the first and second tasks of the Triwizard Tournament. Check out October's issue of Nintendo Power, which has a seven-page spread on the creation of the game, as well as some cool screenshots. In addition, GameSpot.com has just recently played the new Goblet of Fire video game, which is due out on November 15th. They were quoted as saying, The Electronic Arts team is focusing more intently on nailing the look of the film in the Goblet of Fire game. This time around, the artists are striving to make the characters look as close to their real-life counterparts as possible. And wrapping up the news on Goblet of Fire, a countdown has been added to MuggleNet's main page, thanks to Damon. There exists the ability to remove it from the main page, which is considered blasphemy, set the countdown to your location's release date, and of course download the desktop version. For all the specifics, head over to the MuggleNet main page. In other Harry Potter news, Marge of Marilyn created a sorting hat cake, which took 7 hours to complete with special equipment and advanced techniques. They report that it made a very good snack and that they have even eaten it all. Truthfully, however, it might have been wiser for them to put it on eBay. After all, it sure beats Dumbledore's grilled cheese sandwich. Both a picture and recipe are available online. Harry Potter Lexicon has reportedly confirmed the identity of R.A.B. as Regulus Arcturus Black. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the sky and the brightest star in the constellation Bootes. And the Dutch Half-Blood Prince cover was released Friday depicting a staircase with spells flying all over. The book is due out in Dutch on November 19th. Finally, on a serious note, all of us here at MuggleNet were deeply saddened by the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina on the Gulf Coast. If you'd like to help, one way to do so is through MuggleNet's affiliate, Alibons. By purchasing a Redwood Wand, 100% of the profits will be donated to the American Red Cross. This donation special will last until September 12th. Of course, personal donations can always be made directly to the American Red Cross. That's all the news for this September 3rd, 2005 edition of MuggleCast. Back to you guys. Thanks, Micah. Okay, now now let's go to uh, Mr. Andrew Sims, who's going to do some side announcements, and then we'll go to Eric, who's going to handle the contest updates. Well, thank you, Ben. Eric, would you like to talk about the contest with me? Uh, yes, I would, Andrew. So we have a list of prizes <clears throat> this week, and we also have how many people have entered so far? What's that dun, number dun, at? Dun. Well, uh, so far we have 347 entries, which is pretty darn good, and they're looking awesome. 
Okay, and then we also have our prizes to announce. First place. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, we'll wait, wait, wait. You you can't do first place first, dude. You gotta do you know the, okay, the okay, grand okay, prize. Okay, you know you gotta start that way. Okay. Okay. Third place. We got some nice prizes. I think this is pretty good. Third place. We'll win the brand new Lego Harry Potter Goblet of Fire set. Which one is it ah. again? Graveyard scene. Woo! I've always wanted one. Second place. It's pretty cool. Second place will win Eric. They'll, They'll win, win Eric. Eric. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> What do, what do they win, Eric? <laughs> well, they, uh, Andrew, they win uh, a wand of their choosing from the Harry Potter Noble Collection, um, which includes wands from uh, or of Harry's, uh, Hermione's, Ron's, Professor Snape's, um, and several others. I b- believe Dumbledore might be. Yeah, on there. Dumbledore. I'm not too. quite sure. Anyway, a wand of their choosing from the Harry Potter Noble Collection. That's second place. There's so many options. So those are really and nice. And the grand nice. prize is... And the grand prize is... A new car! N- n- uh, I'm no. kidding. <laughs> no. You will win something even better than that, which is the Harry Potter Goblet of Fire-ish scenic game. That new one that just came out, you put the DVD in, you watch... It even, it even has scenes from Goblet of Fire, so you can like get a sneak preview. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Also, uh, most of you might remember that last week we asked, um, how how do you, how does everyone listen to Mugglenet Cast? And guys, an alarming number of people said that they listened to us before bed, like in bed, to give them pleasant dreams. <laughs> well, I guess so. And then I thought, well, maybe it's because we put the show out at two in the morning, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's because we put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, most of the people said, "But you don't put me to sleep. I'll sit in bed giggling or something like that." Um, and then a lot of people listen to us on the way to school, and you know, just on the computer and stuff like that. So that's cool. Keep those coming. Mugglecast at sap.mugglenet.com. I find Ben's um, voice disturbing. I don't know about you. <laughs> I don't know. I fall asleep to it. Really? Oh, and then also, <laughs> last week, you guys might remember that we brought up uh, Mr. Nelson, <coughs> who's going to be using our show to teach his kids in his class how to hold uh, literature discussions and how they can be enjoyable. And this kid who was listening to our podcast at the time, it drew a picture <laughs> of my hand coming out oh, no. of a computer screen and putting at this Did kid he? and quoting what I said last week. So I'll put that in the show notes so everyone can see it. What? Yeah. It was done by uh and oh I my quote, God. Hey, you in the losers, front. You in the front. Age 15. <laughs> he didn't want to give out his real name, I guess. It kind of kind of reminds <laughs> me of Yoda stopping by last week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm that kid's so was, alone. <laughs> that kid was the best. <laughs> Okay, Andrew, do you have any more side announcements? And then I was also going to bring up move on? Yes, I do, Ben. Thanks for bringing that up for some reason. Um, we also have now, we replaced our episodes page with a blog of sorts. <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on that, Ben? Well, um, this, this blog is sort of, it, throughout the week, in between MuggleCast, you can see the weekly updates, what we do in the MuggleCast section, and what, what exactly is going on with Muggle, MuggleCast, who was on past episodes, downloading past episodes, seeing past show notes, seeing the new show notes, and basically everything. And it's then the bread and butter for our podcast, right? There. Right, and then we'd also like to point out how um, there's that fine, 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 fine button you'll notice that says the free iPod book, and basically, um, I was on this site. It's called iLounge.com, and they have brought out this book. It's all about like iPods and stuff, and it gives you tutorials, tutorials on uh, podcasts and stuff like that. It's really cool. And if you have an iPod, it gives you all this kinds of info, like accessories and all that. Um, so it's really cool. So I encourage everyone to click that find find button and uh, check out the book it's actually a free download I was looking through it it's pretty cool um yeah that's that it all? and then I you know I also wanted to bring up how I think it's really cool that we're like the youngest podcasters out there that rock well so yeah much. today but like tomorrow there's gonna be like some three year olds from Australia that start their own you know podcasting site <laughs> yeah well there's this After one where a nine year old does it but it's it's his dad helping him out. It's not even really count. Oh, okay, and uh, guys, guys, enough. I mean, okay. I mean, Ben is nine years old. <laughs> 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 okay, moving on. So thank, thanks for thanks for all those those extra extracurricular announcements, Andrew. Um, Anytime, Ben. Oh wait, wait, Ben, 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 Ben. I have I have another extracurricular announcement. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, no, I just wanted to 
add in a part of this. Uh, last week we talked about Ray Fiennes briefly, um, and and his well, not briefly. It was the main topic, but uh, <laughs> anyway, we uh, we talked about Ray Fiennes and and uh, kind of talked about his uh, his acting ability and whether or not uh, we thought he'd do a good job in Goblet of Fire. Um, and I just wanted to report that on Wednesday night I went to see his newest movie, uh, The Constant Gardener, in which he stars with Rachel Weisz, and it was fabulous. Like it blew me away. His uh, this man can act with like. This man can act with his eyes closed and his hands tied firmly behind his back. I, I, all my doubts, any doubts I, I could have possibly had were erased. Um, it's simply just a fabulous movie. One of, the, one of the problems is, I guess, it's only in the U.S. for now. It won't be released in the U.K. Uh, for another few months. But if you do live in the U.S. and you want to see a movie and want to get a really good feel of his acting, the whole movie is really uh, character-driven. Uh, so you get to see a lot of his acting and a lot of Rachel Weisz's as well. Um, instead, if you want to see him, he's kind of a good guy in this movie, so if you want to see him as a bad guy, um, you can please rent uh, Schindler's List, a uh, Steven Spielberg film with Liam Neeson. It's, it's excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, but he plays kind of like a psycho Nazi guy um, there, so that, I guess that's more of, of how he'd be as Voldemort, but uh, Constant Gardner, basically, you just got to see uh, that he is a really good actor actor, and even though I was worried about him saying that he's not, you know, paying the most attention to his role in this film, I think it'll it'll be great. Okay, back to you guys, sorry. Okay, the main discussion this week, as I mentioned about 600 times before, was that we're going to discuss Goblet of Fire only having one cl classroom scene. This past week, there was some quotes and things released from Mike Newell, the director of the movie, and it appears that there's only going to be one big classroom scene throughout the entire movie which is go probably going to span between two and three hours. M Mr. Lawrence, can you please tell me what's going on? <laughs> yeah, man, I can, yeah. Okay, um, the classroom scenes, I think in the first two, first three, we did see a lot more classroom scenes, but they were the most important material then, because we were still being introduced to the wizarding world and all that, whereas now the Triwizard Tournament is the most important thing in this movie, and in uh, book five it's going to be the confrontation in the Ministry of Magic. So these things have to take precedence over the classroom scenes. Cause, because I think the classroom scenes, they do have a sort of... I think you, you can empathise with the people in there. Well, not really empathise, but people in the muggle world can see the, uh, the wizarding scenes in the classroom and uh, relate them to their own lessons at school. But And, and of course, the first two films were made for, a, well, I think, a t slightly more... I mean, I wouldn't say childish, but a slightly more fantasy wanting audience and that type of uh, relation between the uh, muggle world and the wizarding world is something that by goes well with that but now the the uh, movies are designed to show the uh, darkening side to the Harry Potter series so you need to get rid of all the fantasy stuff that that is really magical and get onto the n sort of nitty-gritty detailed stuff that is important for the septology as a whole I think a lot of people have problems with it because they would like to see the uh the interaction between the students. They, they like Jamie said, they make a connection with classroom scenes. They tend to understand because everyone's been to school before. It's something that we can connect with, and I think people were upset because he only has one, and it's a one thing that people can actually relate to. I mean, the reason this was brought up was because in an interview that came out this week, a small quote from Mike, he was saying how he loves doing the school side of things. Well, I mean, what other school side of things can there be? Ooh, oh, yeah, the, that, that one big thing. That's right, the Triwizard Tournament. Well, no. I, yeah, no. but that's, that's not a school <laughs> thing. By school, he meant, like, classroom Academic. Stuff. No, it is. It's part of the school. It's part Academic of the Academic in nature, not, not um, recreational. Right, exactly. Yeah, but it isn't really recreational because they use it, magic, it, which they learn at school. So it isn't. It's still part of schooling. It's just a bit of fun schooling on the side. What I had thought was that he meant I like the school side of things, as in, oh, I love taping classroom scenes and kids eating in the cafeteria. In hallways, and, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah. in hallways. But, well, what, and, what cool things are there even in the books in the classroom scenes? That, Never, in Goblet of Fire. Well, what people, is there? People will what watch is there that people are going to care so much about that it's going to absolutely be the end of the world if they don't include that scene in the movie? Um, well, no, you guys all make great points, but one of the other things about the classroom scenes is that they really can't do them without uh, having to go all the way. 
Um, because, and what I mean is they, they can't do history of magic without establishing uh, Professor Binns. And, you know, they can't – and, like, like okay, perfect example uh, or rather good example is, is Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, they had to do the Bogart scene in Lupin's classroom instead of the uh, the um, the uh, teacher wardrobe room or whatever that, that was, teacher meeting room conference. Uh, but because that would uh, – that would have mean they, meant that they would have had to uh, do that scene. They would have had to build, the you know, the set and everything for the uh, classroom. I mean, sorry for the wardrobe, and they also would have had to establish Peeves, which they've really, you know, as you can tell, have not been, you know, that willing to do, or at least, you know, it hasn't been a mainstream thing, uh, because on the way to the teacher's staff room, whatever, uh, they made Peeves. So, really, the, by not putting classroom scenes in, they're really avoiding the, the mess of having to, you know, establish uh, Professor Bins and Peeves until they really had to, and I just don't think, I mean, the unforgivable Curses is one of the only classroom scenes in GOF, which is actually relevant to the plot, probably next to the whole, I believe it happened where Hermione's teeth grew bigger or whatever, and they attacked Draco or whatever, but the whole ferret thing, as we know, is also in the movie, so basically, uh, classroom scenes, uh, you know, they use sparingly, and I think they're allowed to, because they have to get on with the rest of the plot. Yeah, but but I don't think it's a financial thing, because, you know, it's got the biggest budget of any movie ever made. So, I mean, if they wanted to keep the bogus in the staff room, they could have done. Yeah, definitely. And you would like to think that they weren't basing the movie upon a budget, and they were basing it upon the story. What people want, yeah. You know. So, I guess we'll see how it turns out. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, Goblet of Fire turns out even despite turns out pretty well, which I think it will, despite the lack of classroom scenes. This past week, Warner Brothers announced when the world premiere and the domestic premiere for the fourth movie was going to be on November 6, 2005, in the United Kingdom. There will be the world premiere, and six days later, in the United States, in New York City, we will have the domestic premiere for the U.S. Why do you guys think that they they decided to have the world premiere in the UK this time when last time it was in Radio City Music Hall in New York City? I think that's exactly the reason. They want to switch it back and yeah. forth. They don't want to upset people. <laughs> Jamie, as a Brit, how, what are your thoughts on yes, this? Yes, as a registered I Brit. I actually thought that the premiere last time, the world premiere, was in the UK, so I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused. Yes, as a registered <laughs> Brit. I think, I don't know, I... I haven't been to the uh, hall in New York. I've only been to Leicester Square, where the premieres take here take take place here. And I, it is such a big atmosphere there. Like it's a freezing cold night, and you just want to wear a short sleeve top, you know. And I think, I mean, for me, that is, you know, the home of premieres. I don't consider anywhere else to be where a film premiere takes place. So, and also because the magic started here, you know, the entire Harry Potter thing started here. I think they want to, at start, I mean, even though the franchise is growing and growing and growing and becoming completely transnational, I think they do want to return to the roots sometimes and just, you know, go back to Britain. Coming from a Brit. I also think it's just to try to keep it fair. I mean, they they won't move it around so people don't think that Warner Brothers is favoring one country yeah, over another, you know. Well. Yeah. Right. I, I think we may just be over over analyzing it a bit. That yeah, but well, last that's time, point, last time it? they may have wanted the premiere in the U.S. and this time they want it in the U.K. So what? It isn't like they have these hidden ulterior motives oh, we that they want the in the ben. U.K. Ben. because, huh? But it does play oh, a part. Oh, we're actually right? supposed to overanalyze. You know, that's our point on the show. We're supposed to overanalyze everything. It's true. Find, yeah. find conspiracy theories. Find holes in everything. No one's safe with the uh, podcasters at MuggleCast. Was that Jamie's phone? Yes, it you, was. Sorry. You know what? It sounded like it had a British accent. <laughs> what, my phone? My phone's got a British <laughs> Yeah, it has. You can set the ringtone. You can have any type of accent, but I thought I'd stay with British, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think that pretty much covers the past week's news and all these topics. <laughs> Jamie's well, before, phone. But, yeah, <laughs> but before we move on to, uh, I think it's prudent before we move on to uh, um, the voicemails and questions submitted by users that we visit this week's section of Spy on Spy. Oh, yes. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I was thinking about this before. Right now, a Emerson is online, so I'm thinking he's sitting in his dorm room at Notre Dame. Or he could be wait, wait, no he isn't, away he isn't online? Or no, he, he could is. be lying he on his bed is on online right now. He could he be is. lying on his bed okay, on well, Yeah, so... So, um, but I think in about 30, 30 minutes to an hour from now, you can probably see him at dinner at South or dinner at North, 
one of you the never two. Know. We never know anymore. I had this idea. I had this idea. If he's not, if he's not online on AIM, we call him. Uh, I we like should. that. I like that. Yeah. Skype out him. Yep. It'd be such a surprise. Yeah. And we wouldn't, Secretly we wouldn't even like have, we wouldn't, we wouldn't say we were on no, Mobilecast. No, we'd, we'd just, just be like, so what's going on? <laughs> then it, <laughs> it tells yeah, everything. Then tell us then his most it on. <laughs> tells his most intimate secrets and we'll uh, broadcast it to the world. Yeah. Okay, well, dudes. Mans. 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 Um, mites. And now, Jamie Lawrence's British joke of the okay. day. Okay, there's one man, and he's considered the international wasp expert, okay? And he's walking down the street, and he sees this sign, and it's a music store. And, th and there's an advert on the outside that says, the greatest tape of wasp sounds ever. And he thinks, well, this can't be right, because there can't be a greatest tape of wasp sounds when I'm the greatest expert in the world, and I have to authorize all the greatest things. So he walks in, you know, strutting his stuff, goes up to the counter and says, do you think I can listen to this tape to see if it qualifies for the, uh, to, to, to ha have the title of world's best wasp sounds? So the uh, person behind the counter says, yeah, of course you can. And he takes him over to a listening station, puts the tape in the thing, turns it on and walks away. So th the uh, international wasp expert picks up the headphones, put th puts them on, and listens. He can't hear anything. He can't hear anything. And, he, and by now he's getting really annoyed. So he calls the assistant back over, and he checks it all, and it's all fine. So then he walks away, he presses play again, and he can't hear anything. And he, he, he's, he, he isn't really happy about this, because you know, he, he's the best wasp ex expert in the world, and he can't even hear what this other person's recording. So he calls the assistant back, uh, and the assistant, he's, he just can't believe it. He can't believe he can't hear it. So he, tag he, he takes out the tape, examines it, and, and, and then just suddenly a look of dawning comprehension comes in his face. And he goes, ah, oh, sir, that's why you're listening to the B-side. <laughs> <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, was Jamie Lawrence's British joke of the thank day. Thank you, thank you. B-side. <laughs> B-side. Shouldn't you have said A-track instead? No, because you know what A-tracks are. Yeah, is. but how many flying insects? I guess nobody knows about them. How many flying insects? Yeah, they're too old. Insects out there called A-tracks. A-tracks. Yeah. I've been stung by an A-track. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whatever. All right. Okay. So now moving on. Roll. Get more brilliant jokes okay. next week. Hey guys, my name is Ale. Um, I want to say I love the show. It's like my favorite thing. Um, my question is: Do you think that Voldemort knows when one of his Horcruxes is being destroyed? Do you think he's aware that he's nearing his own death? Thanks, bye. Jamie, you feel this one, Brit, mate? Dumbledore, I think he covered it when he said that Voldemort is so immersed in evil that he can't feel when he's, when he's dying. But, but when he's one inch from death after all these Horcruxes have been destroyed, then he may know that, I mean, of course, he, he isn't going to be immortal, so he, he'll realize that he can be killed, and after, he, of course, after he has been killed, or while he's dying, he may realize it. But I don't know. I just have this inkling that Dumbledore could be wrong about this, because it, you, because you know, it's such a vital point in the entire book series that it, you know, if he's wrong about this, and therefore Harry's wrong because he told him, it's gonna, it's gonna have severe implications. Because I mean, if he can feel Horcrux being destroyed, then but I don't know because if Voldemort can feel his Horcrux is being destroyed, then so far, you know, he, he he's felt the diary and he's felt the ring. But but do you think he can feel which objects has been de has been destroyed? Like, if a soul is is made up of different things, do you think he can cut one part of it off, like you know, an emotion, love, or something, and then put that into one place? So after it destroys that, he can't feel love, or or do you just have a soul with parts of it that don't mean anything? I know, I think that's a very important question for the whole series. Oh, okay. Because what I was thinking about it was that she was lining it up in the series. So that in in the end of the seventh book, Harry would be the one to tell Voldemort that his Horcruxes yeah, were gone. Yeah, that's quite interesting. It sounded interesting, as though yeah. she was trying to exactly that she was lining it up so that that last moment what, could like come where Harry was the one who the said to exactly yeah. like, "Oh, by the way, Voldemort, it, you're you're yeah. defenseless." No, I like that. I like that. If I kill you, you are dead. But I don't know. That's my theory. Hi, this is Christine again, pronounced Christine, and hopefully you didn't butcher my name this time. Sorry! It's okay, Andrew. It's okay. Okay. And I have a question concerning the cemetery scene in Book 4, and the death of Peter Pettigrew from Book 3. In Prisoner of, Era, as of Azkaban, excuse me, we were introduced to the wizarding death and witnessed Harry saving Peter's life. Now in Book 4, we see Pettigrew sacrificing his hand, a servant's flesh making Voldemort to become whole again. 
The big question is if Voldemort knew about Peter's debt to Harry, because that debt is now flowing through Voldemort's veins. Do you guys think that this has any significance to the plot in Book 7? Y you. Yes, yes, without Absolutely. a doubt. Absolutely. But, Jamie, what do you want to say? Uh, <clears throat> it's hugely important, because uh, I don't think that Voldemort could bear to be near anyone who, has, who owes anything or has any significance to Harry, so I think he'd kill him right away. <clears throat> because, and <clears throat> excuse me, and it isn't only that, but people close to Voldemort, all, all, all of his Death Eaters have to have undying, you know, allegiance to him. Their 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 loyalty can't falter at all. And I think that you know, even if there's just the slightest chance, and this is a big chance that the that Wormtails is going to falter, then he'd have to get rid of him. And Voldemort wouldn't just let him go, you know, and say, "Well, scurry back," because he'd have to fulfil his debt to Harry, and that could be passing information about his old master to him, Voldemort. So I think I think he'd have to kill him if he found out. Exactly. I I also think that. Um, it's been a theory floating around because of the end of book four yes. and Dumbledore um, having that twinkle of, um, I'm not sure what the quote was, but Dumbledore had that almost look of um, success in his eye when he... Gleam of triumph. A, there you go. Um, about the gleam of triumph in his eye when he heard that Voldemort used Harry's blood. And I think this may... Well, not only I think, but a few people think that. No, a lot um, of people think it. Uh, yeah, lots of people think that this may be the reason because Peter has a debt with Harry, and that debt may have passed along through Harry into Voldemort. Kevin, great point. Now, that's kind of cool. I didn't think about that. Like, if he used it, that's really awesome, the whole uh, hand transferring the debt to Voldemort. Now, Voldemort, we've seen, has accumulated lots of lots of debts, like recently. Like, he's he's drank the unicorn blood, so he's got the curse life from that. And, you know, now I think it's really cool if, if he did get the Wormtail curse thing, um, you know, uh, his debt to Harry. And I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see how that plays out, uh, especially at the very end, if Harry is able to get all his Horcruxes and if Voldemort, you know, strangely doesn't know about it or whatever. Um, but that's going to be really cool seeing how all the curses... Uh, that are on Voldemort, as far as we know, are, uh, you know, actually take their toll. Um, one other thing I wanted to say quick was that uh, I don't think, I certainly don't think Peter would, would announce, you know, that he's got, uh, that he's got a debt with Harry, so, which is make, which would just, just make it cooler at the very end when, um, when it, when it was, you know, found out by, by, uh, by Voldemort and everybody else. Hey, I'm Robert, and I had an idea about where one of the Horcruxes is. My idea is that Tom Riddle's trophy that he won for services to the school is a Horcrux. What do you guys think? Okay, I thought this as soon as I read this point. I thought I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, for a couple of reasons. Dumbledore says that Voldemort likes trophies, and while everyone took that metaphorically, I think it could be literal, uh, that he, he likes trophies, you know, trophies that he's received, and... and that must be quite a, quite a special thing to him, that, that trophy. Because, you know, he screwed over Hagrid, and he, he, he got a special trophy, a big trophy, for his services to the school. So I think that, that ha has to be a possibility for a Horcrux. Uh, on the other hand, it's, it's right un under Dumbledore's nose, but, uh, and so Dumbledore wouldn't really have to look far to destroy it. And you'd think he'd have found it by now. I mean, if he can find Horcruxes in caves miles away, you think he could find one that's actually in the school. And... I don't think it would appeal to Voldemort that it's hidden so close to Dumbledore. So, so you mean that uh, Dumbledore wouldn't even think about it just because it's so close? I don't know. I don't know. I think either, yeah, either that that Voldemort would think that Dumbledore, you know, it's so close to him and so obvious that it wouldn't even occur to Dumbledore, and that, and therefore that Voldemort would choose that as a Horcrux, or that it would be so close to Dumbledore that it would be a risk to Voldemort, and Voldemort hates risk and and things that, that could bring him down from power, so he wouldn't choose it. So, but. I wouldn't either. This way, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't I be surprised if it was a Horcrux. You know, if it but turned you, out book seven, then it was. You say that Dumbledore wouldn't even think of that if that one is that one as a Horcrux. But what about say Godric Gryffindor's sword? Isn't that still in Hogwarts? Yeah, that is true. But I don't think that is a Horcrux. I think because oh. I mean, you know, Slytherin. I think Voldemort's a descendant of Slytherin, and since they were such great enemies, there has to be some kind of protection that stops you know. 
a, a direct descendant of Slytherin, you know, using something of Gryffindor's in such a horrible way. I don't know. I mean, that's just how I feel. It's probably wrong. In reference to the sto- the sword? Yeah, the sword. I don't think it could be the sword. Because you, well, in the book, Jamie when said, Harry pulled the sword out, you... And, I mean, you realize that that Dumbledore examined, examined it closely, according to... Uh, to the book, so I don't see a way that he could have put it there. I think that Tom Riddle's trophy is most definitely a distinct possibility, especially since uh, J.K. Rowling loves playing with words, and it would be she would love it to have that sitting right in front of us and not us not realizing it. Yeah. It just seems so strange t- that Tom would make it so easy for a Horcrux to be right in the school. I mean, there's no real protection around it, right? Yeah, but, I mean, the protection is the fact that it's right in front of everyone. Uh, who would okay. t- who would think that right. it, it was a uh, Horcrux when yeah. it's sitting right in front of you? All right, one thing I have to say, guys, is that um, the trophy is, as you say, it's a distinct possibility. It's really cool. I think, yeah, it it really is its own protection if nobody suspects it. Um, I'm pretty sure it probably would have been searched by now, but one thing I really want to bring into uh, the topic right now is uh, a Horcrux at Hogwarts. Now, we've seen uh, Dumbledore, uh, sorry, Voldemort, had to place his uh, Horcrux in the hands of, he had to place his diary in Lucius Malfoy's hands, Um to get it, you know, into Hogwarts. Like, he, the plan was, I guess, as Book 6 says, uh, to put it in Hogwarts, but at a later time. So, but the question is, so could he have made a Hogwarts... Could he, question is, could he have made a Horcrux um, while he was still at Hogwarts? And I think yes, because if you remember, and I was thinking about this the other day, Moaning Myrtle, and now he did kill Moaning Myrtle. Uh, well, he set the Basilisk on her. But really, that's like, that is a murder. And so, if... Assu- assuming Voldemort uh, knew how to create a Horcrux at that time, I don't know exactly what year it was. I think he said it was his fifth year or something like that. I it's doubtful, but that was a murder that he committed. So whether or not you have to make a Horcrux at the scene or not, I think that was a murder that he could have made a Horcrux for, and it was while he was still at Hogwarts. So there could be. I think there's a really great chance of there being a Horcrux there. Uh, whether or not it's you know I. Because the diary was, you know, had to be taken there, so I think there there might be, still be a Horcrux that that reminds of Hogwarts, and I I don't I don't think it's the sword, but the hat, maybe and and some more, maybe one other one that we're completely missing. Hey guys, my name's Vincent, and I'm from Sydney in Australia. I got into the Harry Potter series early in 2000, not long before the fourth book was released, and I was wondering how you guys got into the Harry Potter series, and also if you got into them before all the hype with the movies and the media. Because I just find it interesting to see who else started reading them before all the media attention. So yeah, keep up the great work, guys, and I look forward to your answers. Well, I actually got into Harry Potter after Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, one of my good friends showed it to me, and I've been reading ever since. I got into it when my fourth grade teacher read Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone to us, and right after she finished the book, Chamber of Secrets came out in the bookstore. And I read it, and uh, it was all downhill from there. <laughs> Uphill. In a good way. Uphill. <laughs> uphill. Uphill. Yeah. uphill, Andrew. All right. Um, my story is kind of funny. Um, it's actually in my uh, Potter profile, among that, because uh, that's kind of the funny story I told when I, you know, for that. So I, I'm not going to elaborate much here. But I was actually a, um, n- not really a Harry Potter fan at all. I kind of thought it was uh, stupid, you know, a boy wizard going around uh, for quite some time. Um, and, you know, there's this mean, scary man trying to kill him. Uh, and then, so, that was, like, my 7th and 8th grade year was spent basically not not paying attention to Harry Potter, uh, wh- wh- which was when the, the hype uh, was happening, uh, in answer to Robert's question. Um, so, anyway, uh, the mo- first movie came out in 2001, and I went to see that, and as I mentioned, I believe it was last week, I came into it after uh, movie one and, you know, got hooked and stuff. Uh, but, no, so I, I had... Uh, I had been there had been a few years where I completely uh you know didn't didn't uh wasn't interested in Harry Potter and then it's kind of funny now that here I am working at Mugglenet and you know participating in this podcast and uh you know with all you guys and and uh, have been uh, gotten very far with it but uh anyway so that's that's my story I I've, I I definitely learned uh something about 
Uh, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't judge, you know, read it for yourself and experience and that kind of thing. So I learned something about ignorance. Okay, definitely. and one other thing, guys, um, uh, the the contest is going to run up until episode six. So the moment we release episode six, around midnight, f- Saturday night, it should be, um, the contest will close. Then we'll have a pull-up by episode seven, and then we'll release the, announce the winners episode eight. I I also I also wanted to um say that after listening to the voicemails please leave your name. Oh yeah, everyone leave their name and one other thing um unfortunately we get so many emails with asking questions you have to send us in a voicemail to get your question answered. To have a chance to yeah, get Yeah, I mean we try we, we try to answer some of the emails but we get so many that there's no yeah. possible way we'd be able to get to but, them. All. But we are reading them. We all. are. We just can't answer them all. We're taking your suggestions and your thoughts and your questions. And we appreciate it. We are it. reading them. <laughs> yeah, we just can't <laughs> answer them all. If we used every voicemail, I think we'd have enough for another 3,000 episodes. It's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> For 10 hours each episode. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I think that wraps up this week's edition of MuggleCast. If you have any questions and or suggestions, please visit MuggleNet.com slash MuggleCast or MuggleCast.com for all of our contact information. Also, on those two pages, you can see all the information how to subscribe to MuggleCast, even view our new blog, how to access us through iTunes, or see our show notes. Once again, I'm Ben Shane. I'm Andrew Seams. I'm Kevin Steck. I'm Jamie Lawrence. And I'm Eric Skull. So I guess we'll see you guys all next week. Thanks for listening. Okay, <sighs> everyone, let's roll. Hello, everybody. Can we have, can we Welcome have the schedule? back to MuggleCast. Sorry. I'm Ben Shane. Are you seriously starting like that? That's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. I'll, I'll redo it. Yo, everybody. Welcome back to MuggleCast. I'm Ben Shane. I'm Andrew Sims. I'm Kevin I'm Steck. Jamie Lawrence. Oh, well done. Oh, fuck. Sorry. I f- <laughs> <laughs> no, you could have kept going. You could have. Please. Okay. Can we have the well, schedule the again? Team. Can somebody post the okay. schedule? Can't and, have Jamie, us. we can't redo this shit every time, okay? How is it going? <laughs> <Every fault? laughs> I didn't know I wasn't supposed to go there. I usually go off. It's you. always Jamie. He's like, oh, oh, f- <laughs> shit me. Oh, man. Well, Ben, at least okay, I'm not. Let's... At least I'm not. Hey, yeah, I agree with that point, man. That's a good point, man, man. Good point, man. Okay, okay, okay. Shut up. Okay. Trust the Brit. Exactly, trust the Brit. This is a metaphor for your business's journey. Sometimes it feels like the world is throwing everything it has at you, and to succeed, you need someone to guide you through. That's what Dell Technologies Advisors do. They have the tech advice to help you navigate whatever challenges you're up against and get you safely to where you want to (sighs) be. Call an advisor today at 877-ASK-DELL and do more with modern devices and Windows 10 Pro.